What's good, y'all? Welcome to my review for this week's episode of Sword Online Alization War of Underworld. Man, what an episode this indeed this was. I'm gonna be real with y'all. This episode broke me. This episode legit had me tearing up. You know, you guys who have been here for a while, you guys know that how much I love SAO. You guys know that it's been a pretty big part of the channel for pretty much the entirety I've been here. Since like 2016, once I watched the show, I was posting gameplays, located for like clips or whatever, of SAO Hollow Fragment. I think I even po did, took a playbook page out of IGN's playbook of both like the first hour of gameplay from Hollow Realization, I think, when that game dropped. You guys know that SEO is one of my all-time favorite series of all time. Second favorite anime of all ser series, say, series of all time, of course, behind F FMA and FMA Brotherhood and Tyra the Race. I love both shows for different reasons. But you guys also know that I have been one of the more, I would say, critical fans out there. Like, I'm not someone, one of those people that just shits on the series, shits on SAO, shits on Reki, all day, every day. But you guys also know that I am not one of those people that chills the show. I don't sing Reki's praises all to the high heavens. I give them, I have given the man plenty of shit throughout my, if you guys, throughout my reviews of SAO. Most, most specifically, whenever he decides to use Rape to get his villains over. You guys know how I feel about that. I have mentioned that at nauseam throughout these videos, throughout my reviews of the original analyzation when it happened. When it happened in my thing, so ten. You guys, I went on my little rant or whatever in that. I mentioned it before. Later on, throughout the rest of it, I mentioned it in other videos. Whenever a new character or villain gets introduced, I'm like, for the love of God, no more rape. <laughs> I mentioned it when Gabriel got introduced. I mentioned it again when you had that weird shit with Sugu. And I mentioned it again when when Reki kind of redeemed himself. This is what a lot of, this honestly is what this arc has mostly been. It is on a way, I mentioned before how I think SAO Alcination, which I mentioned before, this was supposed to be the original uh, ending for this year, but for whatever reason, Reki was convinced to make one more R, which is what the light novels are on right now. I mentioned it that SAO Alcization was almost like a soft reboot the series. It focused more on just like the main character that I need to focus on and then it just kind of went from there. And in a way this also, sh and like I said before, this is also worked as a soft reboot, but it also showed you how much Reki improved as a writer. You could see it a lot throughout the characters and everything, the world building, whatever, all that shit. You could see a lot of Reki's improvements as a writer through this arc. Through the characters of Alice and Yujo. Yujo especially. Yujo was such an amazing character. But this also has served as almost Reki's redemption in a way. Because even though he kind of fucked up with Sugu, at the, when he kind of like reintroduced her with that stupid shit with the tentacles, he did fix it and did rectify that. When he like had Austin, when she had Sugu kind of a, kind of when she had like those spears and pale her eyes and shit. And she just kind of just kept moving forward and was like, whatever. She pulled out there and still kept fighting. You had that. You had all the stuff with Austin that I thought was pretty good. He actually kind of like focused a little bit more on their relationship. Not much, but apparently there's more stuff that was cut. That was more stuff that was there, but it was cut from the light novel. So whatever. And other things. This episode, in a lot of ways, as well, in that it kind of showed off really how much SEO did affect here. Because a lot of people say that, that they don't, that Reggie never really showed how it really affected Kirk, which I agree with. Because you really don't see him have any real PTSD at all or anything from it. Like, you know, except from that one nightmare suit. And then you go and got some people say like, Oh, if it really affected him, he would never touch another VR MMO or whatever ever again. And that almost has a leg to stand on, but once you start putting in the context of the other seasons and orcs, yeah, it, it, has, it has nothing. It got nothing. But I digress. This episode overall was like I said, like it really showed, it really, really did make it a point to focus on what, on how SAO affected him and all that shit. Man, was it. Like I said before, it had me tearing up, man. It legit had me tearing up. But we'll talk about that scene 
once we get there. Now, right before we jump right into the episode itself, there's a couple things I mentioned, and you guys might remember I mentioned in my, in my previous review, from last week's episode, that I mentioned that there were some things that I was kind of confused on, and that I was going to watch Fox's review, since he's a light novel reader, he would kind of like fill in the blanks. So let me tell you, so let me go over those, some of the bigger ones real quick, for you guys that are also like, oh, is that me? That was also kind of a bit iffy on some of the details. So, was that kid that we saw that's, that's, that's uh, Vasago's half-brother really cute to? No, that's just a guy that looks like him. And you had that, and the, another main difference was, another main difference was that got cut out was the fact that, that, that actually, that Vasago isn't legit, like, isn't the second coming of Hitler, so to speak, where he wants to, like, kill all the Japanese. We said, like, now I can kill the Japanese I want. He was, like, and laughing coffin were somewhat Nazis. It wasn't completely that. What actually happened was he got into which and which what happened was that S, that when that there was some that he had like because he was like working for like this organization. There was a hit out on this person and that care and that person was inside the SCM game. So whatever the organization was working with got him a nerve gear and that's how he and that's how he logged into SEO and that's how he took care of it. And he very much was like, I'll take care of this guy, but it doesn't really matter who who else gets like in the way in the process. He didn't really care. And three, he actually does. He actually isn't racist towards the Japanese. More so, he hates Asians in general. For whatever reason, I think it might have something to do with his step that with his with his dad or something. But whatever. Anyway, enough me rambling. Let's just jump right into this episode. So we start this episode off. We got Kirito. He's inside this classroom. There's a sunset. He's looking out towards it. He's just looking at it, and he's like, eh. You know, I should probably go home now. So he starts walking, walking home. We see, uh, we see, uh, we see a, like a cross sign. It goes to green, letting him walk. And then, if you like, pay attention as everyone's like kind of like, walking past into their uh, places. You can see Kirito passes right, right passes right past Alice. And then while he's on the train, the thing, the uh, you know, the um, the PA system or whatever goes on about like, hey, you know, cargo stop, final stop, final stop. Which is, of course, which is Kirito stop. He goes out there. If you see, if you pay attention, there's a guy on the on the bench. You can see Yujo reading a book. Now, what does this mean? I don't know. I don't know if this is just like maybe like some symbolism or just recce try or if this is gonna serve some purpose because of the relationship he has with these two. If it's something to do with like his consciousness, his main consciousness is like merging with his Alice's eight with the consciousness he had in the underworld when he was a kid, being friends with, with Yujo and Alice. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but hey, it looked cool. I thought it was nice, maybe this is just his psyche just fucking with him. I don't know. Kirito's brain dead at this point. So who the fuck knows? It's probably all merging anyway. All of his consciousness are probably merging anyway. His memories and everything. But regardless, afterwards he. But after, regardless, he, as he's walking, you know, while well, he's walking through like this neighborhood or whatever, he hears someone say, "Kirito." He looks over into this alleyway, and there is Saichi with her crew. Now y'all know what that means. <laughs> y'all know what that scene represents. Y'all know what happens there. Which I feel like that was in a weird way, Recky, kind of warming you up for what happens later on. Because, man, this shit hit the fan. <laughs> and, man, does it start hit? It starts tugging on them hard strings, ladies and gentlemen. But anyway. Anyway. So afterwards, we then head back over to the well, First up, right there, once he says Saichi, bam, it cuts right to the OP. Which, the OP was a little bit different from where it was, but it was practically the same. The main OP itself stays the same. They only changed, like, the last the ending of it. Instead of it's instead of the title then going into Kirito, it goes title into Alice, which she looks like she's like in the real world. And then it like zooms in on her eye. You see a lens on it and then you see like the thing that like and then you kinda like see someone inside like this glass container or whatever that says Link Star and then a hand is pressed against it. Who could that be? Could it be Alice? Could it be Yujo rising? Could it be Yujo? Could it be fucking Kayupa rising from the dead? I don't know. We'll find out. But anyway. Anyway. So then it heads back over to Vasago and everything that happened there with them getting all the players to, like, you know, fight amongst themselves, all the soldiers, and all that shit. It tells Kirito that I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna make you wake up regardless, and if you don't wake up quickly, I'm gonna, all these people are gonna die. This other thing. So then, afterwards, so then we head over to Alice. He, we then see Vasago knows there's this one guy just kind of sitting there that's wounded. He picks him up and he says, I think I'll start with you. Asta tries to go and stand up and go against and fight him just so he doesn't kill him. But of the last, she can't stand. She's like, no, I can't stand. But then, then Reki starts down. That's when Reki like takes the gloves off. I was like, no, I'm not pulling no more punches anymore. 
we then see someone grab we then someone see someone wrap her arms around Asuna and it's Yuki. Yes, Yuki. From Mother Rosario, Yuki. Yes, I yeah, and I was that's why I'm like, oh, oh man. Cause um because Fox said in his review last this episode was going to be uh this episode was gonna make you tear up. Which it did. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh shit, the man was not lying. <laughs> but anyway. So, uh, but anyway, she says, I know you can stand Asuna. And that's when Asuna just gets back up and just bolts right towards him. She, but the dude, but, but he, but he, the Saga man just to dodge it. He then goes in for his own attack, but like the floor cracks underneath him. However, that worked. I don't know if that was fucking Yuki giving her some backup or just luck. But the floor breaks and he ends up missing his shot, only like getting, her, only cutting her side up a little bit. So then she, so then she like stomps on the ground and like goes for another attack. And by this time, their blades just clash against each other, and you got the sparks flying and everything. And so then they're going at each. So then they're just kind of like looking at each other, being obstinate. Is like, why do you hate Kirito so much? What did he ever do to you? Now at this point, I think and I was thinking that they might throw the in that one moment for the light novels that got cut from last episode, because apparently, um, like I mentioned before, the guy that we saw that Spasago's half brother was not indeed Kirito, it's some other kid that just looked like him. That apparently that, you know, he hate that the reason he like doesn't like Kirito is because he reminds him of him and he wants to kill him for that reason because, you know, the dude stole his kidney or whatever. And all that shit. So anyway, we then, so anyway, um, after that, um, yeah. So anyway, we then had, so yeah. So, I, so he tells him like you know the reason that he that you of all people would know why I why I would love why I love him, and the dude goes on about how in a world full of scumbags he is the one person that could never be con that could never be corrupted no matter how hard I tried, and that after the that that after I tried and failed to kill him on the fifth floor I you know, he brings me nothing but hope and joy which I'm not gonna lie I don't know if Ricky did that on purpose because of all because of all the Jesus Coon memes. I don't know if that's be like an in joke to that, or or if he's trying to like compare him to Superman or something. I don't know, but whatever. So anyway, um, yeah. So anyway, afterwards, also it's kind of like hope. And actually, while this is going on, you see like these particle effects or whatever. I don't know if this was like particle effects or whatever. Um, like surrounding his sword is meekly. And, and, like, I'm not gonna lie, it looked really fucking cool, like, legit. Whoever animated, whoever animated that, give that man a fucking raise. Give that, and whoever did the fucking water and the ED, give that man a raise as well. Because, my god, the animation on both of those was fucking perfection. It was immaculate. But anyway, so, and so then he kind of goes on about the stats for sword and how it works. So, or, I guess, meekly, but technically. But anyway, in SAO... The meat cleaver words how, or it's called the meat. It's called the mate chopper. Interesting name. But how it worked in SAO was that whenever you would slash someone, its stats would go up. But in uh, but in Alice, but in Underworld, which I'm assuming this has to deal with the incarnation system, how it works is that oh, it absorbs like I guess like the life energy of, from the dead bodies. It absorbs life from the dead bodies. So all the people that they that Austin uh, and the rest of the crew and also soldiers coming in from like Korea and Japan and the States and everything that are killing a Japanese player. All of that is getting absorbed in this sword, which is probably the reason why you guys have probably noticed his sword's been getting bigger and bigger and bigger with each passing episode. Especially in this episode, it gets fucking huge. It's practically an axe at this point. But anyway, so so after that, he kind of like, after he explains that, he like, the sword is like, is, is the meat cleaver, is, is a meat, meat chopped or whatever, is slowly kind of like, sliding down Oslo's blade and you know he's like don't worry I won't kill you for I won't kill you but you know he goes on about how I'm going that that and that he's pissed off that Kirito is now like this when he wasn't there and that he is going to end and that he is that no matter what he will make him he will have him rise again no matter how many hundreds and tens of thousands of players he must or AIs or whatever he must kill off he will do it all to get Kirito back up and once he does he will kill all the artificial fluff lights in this world and have Kirito die in his arms. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So like I said, the blaze slowly started to go down and down and down and down more and more. Also then goes down to a knee. And that's when Yuki shows up again and this is when the and this is when it gets good, man. <laughs> man, the animation here was fucking god tier once again, ladies and gentlemen. So 
So as Saga was taking more and more of the advantage and like her sword is starting to crack and shit, she like just closes her eyes and then that's when Yuki shows up again. She puts her hands on her bed and says, it's alright, and wraps her arms around her again and says, I'll always be by your side. And then, Asuna truly becomes a goddess. I think we can all, I've mentioned before how hot she is, but I think I can now say she is as beautiful as an angel because she gets fucking wings! <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, Asuna, best girl, a goddess, Beautiful, stunning, whatever you want, to call her, gets wings, ladies and gentlemen. And, ooh, this is when shit gets. This is when shit gets real. And of course, you no, know, this is and everyone's like cheering her on. You got Silica and the others be like, you can duck Asuna, you know, and all that shit. So she stands back up. She pushes him off, and then you can, and then, and then the lights are. They do that thing where like the lines get thicker again. I don't know why anyone does this. Like, like I said before, in that one episode where we had Masa, where we had Gabriel going up against uh, against. Uh, uh, I thought it looked really cool, but I'm curious why anyone does that for the giant, like, Sakuga fights. Don't know why, I don't know if it's, like, easier to animate that way, or if there's another reason behind that. I don't know if any of you guys are animation gurus or whatever, you can explain the reason behind that. Please write down in the comments. But anyway. So then she charges right in there, she goes and, like, sets up for an, uh, for an attack, and, you know, Yugi's right there, she puts her sword on, puts her hand on, on Austin, so they look at each other, and they just charge right at him, and then they just start, and then she just starts slicing this motherfucker all over the place, it's, oh my god, it looked amazing, and then she just, like, just straight up goes for a straight up, just straight up impales the guy, he hits her with the sword, creates this giant hole in his stomach, sends him flying into a wall, and then he falls over with the rubble coming around top of him, like I mentioned before, but it's, all. Uh, I'll say it again, the animation here was god tier. A1 does not fuck around with SAO, ladies and gentlemen. Man, didn't look so good here, man. It was absolutely fucking phenomenal. I loved the animation there, man. Oh, it looked so good. Man, it looked so good. Absolutely love the animation there. So anyway, so anyway, after that, so and anyway, I'm and I'm thinking the dude's dead. No way he survived that. Also, kind of lands and she like puts her sword on, like, puts her slash, puts her like impales her sword to the ground. She kind of just sits there and then her wings kind of dissipate into feathers and then you see you can kind of like uh, kind of like going up, you know. She's like and you know and she's like and also like thank you, Yuki. And then I'm thinking the dude's dead. No way. But since I'm the the man's not dead. We've seen this before in other animes and T shows. Whenever you think the villain's dead, he's never really dead. So then he starts to get up. Zelda's like, wait, he's up again, or whatever. So then he starts to rise up. He still has this giant hole in his stomach, in like, the, in like his midsection. How he's still standing, I don't know. The dude now has, now he's like, me, now, now his like sword or knife or axe at this point has, is like ludicrous, ludicrously big. And he says, see, this is the true nature of, the, of them. This is the, the, the spineless, dirty Japanese. Kill them all or whatever. And he just like puts his sword forward and all, the, and all those soldiers just come charging right towards him. They actually, like, a lot of them just run right past Austin, but, like, one of the back, one of those son of bitches, I swear, it was the same son of bitch that slapped her. Fuck him. <laughs> but someone, like, like bumps into her, she falls onto the ground, and then you kind of see Kirito just kind of, like, like, reaching out towards her, and Austin's reaching out towards him, and she's like, Kirito! And then, then we get back to Kirito, and... Well. <laughs> oh my. Oh my. Reki, you weren't playing, man. You were not playing. So then, so then we get back to Kirito. And it's right where Saichi, you know, the dude opens the chest and, you know, all the crew. And her crew starts dying one by one. It was, it looks like they actually reanimated this section. And they didn't just replay the clip from season, which was nice to see season one with the art style of season three. I thought that looked pretty cool. But anyway, of course, the crew starts dying one by one. And Saichi dies. Slow motion and all, you know. And Kirito's like, yeah, yeah, and like, I'm not going to do the scene job, but like, the scream, now, I mean, the, the scream from Kirito's voice actor, bro, Kirito's voice actor here was fantastic, man, I can't wait to see Bryce do this shit in the Dove Coast, Bryce can do the emo, like, some hard hit emo stuff, just watch Attack on Titan Season 3, Bryce was on his A game with that, with that, bro. That'll, we'll get there when we get there, whenever the dub airs, I can't wait for that, but anyway, he screams out, he like just starts holding, and he, and next up, 
comes the guy that, you know, says, B you beaters have no right to get involved with us, and the dude jumps off the ledge. And Kirito screams out again, he just grabs his head, and he's just like, he's like covering his ears, and he's like crying, and he's just like, I don't want to see anymore, I don't, I don't want to hear anymore, I don't want to see what comes next. And you just see a montage of all the people that Kirito was somewhat involved with their deaths like that. One player they tried to revive but didn't want it. The one guy he chopped to death, the one guy that poisoned him. Of course, the guy from Laughing Coffin. And then it kind of, and then they go to Suko, which they kind of really focus in on that. And the way this whole thing was edited together was beautiful, by the way. The editing here was great. But then they go to Suko, which, I'm going to be real, I always enjoy watching that motherfucker get, get killed. Because <laughs> I've already told you all the story about what happened with me and Austin and all that shit when I was watching season one. But that was, but it's always a funny, you guys have seen me in my reaction, I was just laughing. <laughs> I was just laughing watching that motherfucker slowly perish. <laughs> but anyway, after that they then go over to lap, they over then go over to Death Gun, and then Kirito's just like, and then, and then he's crying and then you see like tears going down onto like, you know, the floor and everything. But then you hear that boom of the axe hitting a tree. And then we start seeing Yujo. And yo, I gotta say, Yuki Kajira? 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 I don't know how you say your last name, but Yuki, the composer that does all the that does the sounds that for all the SAO seasons, I think she also did uh, the Gigio spin off as well, I believe. My god, I love that woman's score. She is. So talented, man. I love that woman's music, man. She's just so good. But anyway. So, but anyway, man. Fuck. <laughs> so then, after, so after he starts getting to you, Joe, he then, we see some clips of you, Joe, and then we see, of course, his death again. Kirito is just like, ah! And he's like, I can't take it anymore. And the dude legit rips off the front of his, you know, jacket away from his, you know, Alsatian, Alsatian. And then he legit starts Bruh, <laughs> man was cringing. He starts like grabbing, like tearing off the flesh of his chest, and you hear the bones cracking. I mean, you don't see nothing. You just see some blood splatters hit, you know, the floor. But oh, you can hear it. Oh, man was cringing here, man. Man was cringing. Man was legit cringing here, boys. Like. Whew! That was nasty. That that was pretty nasty. But anyway, uh, <laughs> oh man. But anyway, like the dude, he's just like he's just like and he's about to just grab into his chest and rip his heart out, I guess, because he just doesn't want to live anymore. He just can't take it anymore from uh, all this, man. And just and then he says, and then he hear Arthur say. And then Austin shows up, bro, at this point, I just lost it. Yeah, man, I, I, once Austin showed up, I just started tearing up, man. Like, I mean, I wasn't crying, crying, but you boy, but I could feel that I was tearing up, man. You could actually see me wiping my eyes around this part of the episode on me, man. Oh, my God. But then after the all, but then after Austin shows up, then Sion shows up, then Suhu. Kirito just kind of looks at them while he's like dead inside the point. His eyes have bags and everything. I am not doing this scene justice whatsoever. But anyway, he just says, What? I have no, no I don't have any rights to receive your forgiveness. I'm sorry, Asuna. I'm sorry, Sion. I'm sorry, Suzu. I can't stand anymore. I can't fight anymore. And he just legit just blows into his chest. And you can see like blood pouring out. And he legit grabs his heart. You legit see him grab his heart. And I'm like, damn. <laughs> this episode was not fucking around with the blood. No, sir. Then we go over to Higa. And he's just like, damn it, what's going on? Why isn't Kirito waking up? What's going on? If only there was one more person that had like a, that had a strong like mental image of him or whatever, a memory. That maybe I can get him up. And then he notices like this there's like this program or whatever from the underworld coming out there and of course it's Yujo. So Kirit so Yujo calls out to Kirito, Kirito looks up at him and he says, Yujo, you're alive. Yujo just shakes his head and says, No, this is just the memory of me and the fragment memory I left behind. And he's like, Memory? He's like, Yes, have you forgotten already? At that time we were both certain 
And he says that memories are right here. Which I'm assuming he's pointing towards his heart. <laughs> and Kirito's like, yeah, and he like points to like the giant hole in his chest. <laughs> he just like puts his hand over there and he's like, yeah. And then Asuna and the elders just show up and they tell him that we're always connected to you, that we'll always be a part of you no matter what, and that feelings like, and memories are always connected, isn't that right? And, bro, at this point, this is when it really started hitting. I was like, I was on the line, I was borderline crying at this point, man. Like, oh man, the tears were hidden, man. This is this, this part of the episode was really hit right here, man. Breathy, oh. man, Jesus. <laughs> But anyway, right after, but then after that, so he, after that, he extends his hand out to him, and or actually, Kirito asks Yujo if it's all right for him to walk again, for him, to, you know, start walking. It's like, of course, you know, just people waiting for you. So then Yujo extends his hand out there, and he says, "Now, it's a time for us to go take to for us to go over to where this takes us." Kirito gets back up and he, and he takes his hand and of course Asuna, Suzu, and Sia all put their hands on top of them and they all start nodding and then it fades to white back to um, the other one. Now, look. We all know that SAO is in the most well-written series out there. It is no Tokyo Ghoul, it is no Vinland Saga, it is no Naruto, it is no Hiroaka. It is no bleach. But damn it, does Reki have his moments? This is one of them. Now look, now this This scene right here was I meant for this was one of those moments of Reki that Reki's had, like cause the Reki is a. I wouldn't say he's a. I wouldn't say, necessarily call Reki like a great, uh, 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 like amazing writer, but I say he's a good writer. You know, all things, all things considered, he has his moments, like I said before, and he does have his flaws. Like I mentioned before, in countless times, I consider Sao a flawed masterpiece. One thing this episode really did was really show. How SAO and all the deaths from SAO affected Kirito, and you could also make the argument for some of the other deaths that happened in I in Alfheim and uh, GGO, but not to the same extent or really at all. Really, because you know, he wasn't actually killing people then; they were just and they was just killing them, and they would yo know, rise back, right back. They would like respawn or just you know get kicked out of the game or whatever it was. Now. I mentioned before, but I think I mentioned this before earlier on the video, but one thing I noticed that people were complaining about some a couple times was like, Oh, if SAO really affected Kirito that much, you would never pick up another VR MMO ever again. Which, I mean, at first glance you can kind of see that, see their point, but at the same time, once you really start to think about it and put the context of the other seasons in there and the other arcs, it kind of starts to fall apart. Like, that's why, I don't think I mentioned, but in case I mentioned this earlier, I might be repeating myself, but... This is why I would say that's almost as, like uh, almost as stupid as people complaining about the destruction in Man of Steel. Because with Man of Steel, people were like, oh my god, there's too much destruction! And I'm like, motherfucker, it's a superhero movie, what do you, what do you expect? Shit not to blow up? Like, and I love the fact that no one ever brought up the destruction in Age of Ultron. Nobody ever brought the destruction in the first Avengers. But let's be real, we're ten times as worse as Man of Steel. Now, if you said your men did not, com did not save enough people, did not save enough people, then okay, then you have a leg to stand on. But you saying there's too much destruction is fucking retarded. Because, like I said before, no one was ever complaining about the destruction in Man of in not Man of Steel. They were about that, but in the first Avengers film or Ultra. It wasn't until the films themselves, the MCU, brought it up. Did anyone ever bring any mention towards it when it was a, when it was one of the plot points we saw in the trailers for Civil War? That same logic, that same thing, kind of kind of happens with this movie as well, with this show as well, to an extent. This episode now, Graham. Now, yes, back in season two, we also saw how it affected Kirito then too, where he's just like, "Oh, I don't deserve to live" or whatever. And he's just like going off to the nurse, and the nurse is like. If it really didn't affect you, you wouldn't be hurt so much. I saw that on Twitter, actually, I think a couple weeks back. And that was something I saw in the comments of the post. I think overall, this uh, this episode, this scene right here, 
did a much better job of showing off how it affected Kirito mentally and emotionally. Because like I said, I was tearing up, which I know that does not happen to me very often. Very rarely during shit do I ever start tearing up. This is probably the closest I've ever been to straight up crying watching something. I'm a be I'm being real with you. Except maybe that one scene around the end of Devil Man Cry Baby. This is the closest I've ever come to straight up cry. Because this really shows you how it meant to like I said before, it shows you how it affected Kirito. Like you see him and the which mostly comes down not only to the editing of how this episode was edited together with all the clips of them coming run coming after Kirito one right after the other, one right there. Kirito got no time to bring. It just hit him one right after the other. First it was, you know, Side Chief. Then it was the guy that died that, that killed him that died. Or no no, it was Side Chief. Then the dude that jumped off the bridge or the or the ledge. Then the dude that died around the, after the first floor boss. And then the one guy he like Kirito like chopped after he got poisoned and then of course you got then they focus and then the guy that he killed from death that was from part of Laughing Coffin and then of course the last two which and of course the last two being Suko and Death Gun and a lot of it comes down at least to me anyway to Kirito's voice actor like, lo- like Kirito's voice actor right there Ooh man he, man, really went in with the voice. Like, you can feel the emotion, the pain, and torment in his voice, man. The screams. Like I said before, I am very excited to see Bryce. Yo, who's the English voice of Kirito. I forget the dude's last name. But I can't wait to see his take on this, because it's going to be epic. Whenever that does air on Toonami. But to bring it back to what I said earlier about about the whole thing with um, Kirito never touching any game again or whatever. I It's like I said, he didn't really have much of a choice because when you think about it, after LSAO, do you really have much of a choice in the matter of jumping into Alfheim or GGO? Because look at it like this. In Alfheim, you had Kirito's girlfriend slash in-game wife at the time kidnapped by Suko. Is that, and what do you expect him to do? Just be like, oh, no, nah, man, this PTSD, man. No, nah, I, I can't, like, like, fine, that's your fucking woman. Of course you'd be like, fuck my PTSD. I gotta save her. Like, now, do I think Wrecking could have done a better job in the earlier arcs to show Kirito having PTSD problems or whatever instead of just, like, one nightmare sequence? Like, maybe have something where, like, Assassin's Creed, where, he, like, there's, like, a bit of a bleeding effect going on there, where he sees, like, the phantoms of his past, or something. You know, stuff like that. I think could have added a little bit more, and probably made, would have, and probably would have made, uh, probably would have shown a little bit more Kirito's mental state, other than, like I said before, that one scene uh, earlier, yeah, that one, that one scene back in season two, and then, of course, like, here with this one, which... Like I said, and then, yo, man, when he starts, like, gripping at, like, his, like, his, like, chest and, like, starts, like, ripping the bones out and you see him actually grab his heart, man. Ooh. Damn, man. Like, it was crazy, man. But, yeah, man. So, yeah. Like, I don't really got much more to say on the scene other than just, Retki really did a good job here, man. Like, I always like I said before, SAO is not the best, was not the most well written series out there, but it is pretty good all around. And Recky does have his moment. Like I said, this is one of them. And that scene right there was done real well. I don't know how it was it done in the light novels. I don't know what got cut, or if anything did get cut, or if there was some other meaningful shit that would have just you know added that made that would have really much put me over the edge. But but it, but whatever the case may be, man. That scene was really done. That scene was really well done, man. And you know, like I said before, props to Kirito voice actor, voice actor, man. That man did such a great. And also, Yuki's soundtrack just added to that scene so much, man. Like, oh, that woman score, man. That woman does not fuck around when it comes to soundtrack. That she is so good. I love her music. I love it. I love every time she's on a an, on a soundtrack. She does a soundtrack. It's always god tier shit, man. It's always so good. But anyway, enough of me rambling around this lesson. Let's finish off this episode with. With one of the coolest moments in, in SAO, let's be real. This, this was pretty awesome. So we see the giant portal surround the area, and everyone, all the soldiers killed everyone. And you got Visago, like the swords, like absorbing what, absorbing their essence or whatever. And he's just like, <laughs> he's just laughing maniacally like a madman. 
and you got Asuna like slowly crawling her way over to Kirito. And so oh, she's reaching out, but then this then this motherfucker steps on her arm and is about to like impale her. I am begging, pleading, because like I said, like like I said, I was tearing up. I was like, Brecky, please don't! Come on, man! I can't take much more of this man! But thankfully, we then and then she like closes her right, but she opens them up, or it might have been beside me. And but we hear someone say, Is that the scent of roses? And then Vasav kind of like gets all excited. He like turns, he like, like repositions his, his sword or his axe at this point. Looks behind, he's like, <laughs> the animation here looks fantastic as well, by the way. And he's like, yes, finally. And he turns over and he turns around and he look, and then we see Kirito and he just says, Bunkai. Okay, he said it has all of it, but fuck it. Y'all know me. If you were watching my Alice's Ace interview, you know that that is that I call that a bonka, because that's what it is. The bleach references are strong with this one, man. But anyway, he, un he unleashes the, he unleashes, you know, Yujo Bankai. Covers, it's like, takes, covers everyone in ice that isn't, of course, with his team. And then he gets back up, and then, um, and then also, like, sees as she gets back up, she's like, Kirito, and she starts walking towards him. Masago breaks through the glass, Zelda comes rushing toward them, but she gets bodied like nobody did. She just gets, like, one, like, he, like, fires off something like that mist or whatever at her, and it just, like, sends her flying. So, yeah. And then she goes over, and then he just, like, rushes over there to finish the job. But then, right as he does that, Kirito, um... But yeah, right, right as he does that, Kirito, once they get over there, you, there's a force field that surrounds them. I'm like fucking up my words. There's a force field that's around, that surrounds them, and you see like a, a hand butt. So then you see Kirito walk, st stand up, uh, and he starts walking towards, the, and he starts walking towards, he gets his hand back. And by this point, like, and then after that happens, Swordland starts playing, and bro, I fucking lost. You all see, y'all see my reaction, but man, lost it. I was like, yes! I was like, I was like, slamming my chair and everything. It was hype. Now, I wouldn't say this was as good as, say, when Halloween Kyoma made his triumphal return in Steins Gate Zero. But man, was it close! Man, was it close! And that's pretty. And so, and after that, that's after he gets his hand back and everything. That's pretty much where the episode ends. So it's here with Asuna looking to Kirito. She says, "Welcome back, Kirito." And, Asuna, and Kirito just turns behind her and says, "And he just looks kind of like he says Asuna, and, or whatever, man." And just oh, that's where the episode ends. So it's kind of pissed off. This wasn't at least a cliffhanger like the last two were, thankfully. I was like, hey, one, what's y'all, what's y'all, what are y'all, so hang up on these uh, cliffhangers, but, yeah, man, that is the end of the episode, so next week, I believe, was called, um, I actually forget the title name right now, but, it seems like it's gonna be probably, next week is probably gonna be mostly just gonna be like, you got your animation, you're probably gonna Kirito go, but yeah, Masago. I don't know where Gabriel is gonna come in all this because the man after this fight with Sion, he's pretty much vanished off the face of the earth. <laughs> like Gabriel was probably one was probably the best. Vasago too as well. These are I would definitely say both him and Vasago are definitely the best villains at SAO. I, I think I like Gabriel a bit more just because those earlier episodes and you know, stuff with the souls, Elise, and everything. I'm really curious to see where that goes. I don't even, I, I'm curious to see if Rekki is just going to drop Gabriel. He's solely focusing on Masago, or we are going to see him make a return. Maybe we're going to see him and Gabriel double team together, and then Kirito and Asa are going to work together to take him down. I don't know. But regardless of such, man, this episode was absolutely fucking fantastic, man. And Brecky, like I said this before, well, I'll say it again, you did good. You did good with this episode, like. That scene was very, that scene right there with Kirito just losing a man and, you know, emotions and everything, man. <laughs> and, man. <laughs> oh, man. That, but anyway, guys, I've rambled on long enough. I'm into here. 
So yeah, guys, tell me down below what you guys thought of this episode. Did you love it? Did you hate it? What are your opinions on the scene itself with Kirito ripping his ripping his heart out and all that stuff? Did you think it was very good? Do you think there should? Did you think this did a good job of explaining? Of Kir, did you think Rekka did a good job of explaining why Kirito why, about Kirito's mental state after the post about how, how it has how SEO did affect him and all that shit? Tell me all that down below, guys. And yeah, hope you enjoy, overall I'm around my rating. <laughs> Overall, I'm going to give this episode a 10 out of 10, ladies and gentlemen. Hope y'all enjoyed the video. If you like it, subscribe if you're new. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Flag, links down in the description box below. And as always, come back for more. See you guys next time.